paper, white wealth, uh, and, and other materials have made him uh, a standby on uh, many uh, television and radio shows, as well as important symposiums and conferences on the issues of economic empowerment for the descendants of, of Africans in the United States of America and throughout the world. Uh, he is, whenever there's an important national convention or convening of people to talk about this subject, I never fail to uh, find him on the program and enjoy him immensely. We re welcome now Dr. Claude Anderson. Thank you very much. And uh, to my colleagues, let me say good afternoon to you and plus the members of the audience. Uh, according to John's letter, he indicated to me that he wants me to speak to develop a national plan. And John, that's what I'll try to do for you very quickly. But let me preface that by simply saying that that if you hear about reparations, get this very firmly fixed in your mind. You're not here for a parlor discussion. It's not something to talk about that's nice. If you don't get reparations, black folk, you're through in this country. Let me be that very specific for you. You see, what's happening to black Americans <clears throat> is that black Americans have been systematically, socially engineered into the lowest level of a real life monopoly game. You do not own and control a sufficient amount of anything to be competitive in America. And you get, you've been marginalized now for 400 years. You're getting ready to be buried. You can get buried under at least a whole broad groups of ambiguous groupings. That's everything from culture groups, language groups, and gender groups. You're going down. You, it's no longer an issue. You better get reparations and get it fast. Now, to get reparations, one of the things I've been trying to do now for 30 years, uh, beginning with, with the state of Florida, when Governor Rubin asked you to put me over education when they had no blacks, blacks in politics in Florida, was to write the first affirmative action plan in the United States, and that was written to be reparations for black folk in 1971. And George Bush just, Jr., I guess, uh, what's his name, Jed Bush just killed it off about six months ago. But, but what's happening now is that what I'm trying to do is create a Harvest Institute that would try to take all my colleagues here and as much as possible try to give you new points of information that take you outside the box. Part of the problem we got in trying to deal with reparations and a lot of the other racial issues in the country is that we keep trying to think and find solutions inside the box. There are no solutions inside the box for black folk. You got to get outside and try to find and get a long-term perspective and a long view on it. And that's what the Harvest Institute is in existence for, and that's what they're going to stay in existence for. Now, the reason you cannot win, as I said, is that you've been locked into this low level of a real-life monopoly game. You do not own and control enough of wealth. See, in 1860, for instance, black folk, as a direct result of slavery, had an ownership. When you were 98% slaves, you had an ownership of one half of 1% of this nation's wealth in 1860 on the eve of the Civil War. Now, this is the richest country in the world, the most capitalistic country in the world. And here you are 140 years after slavery when you're supposedly 100% free and you still only have one half of 1% of this nation's wealth. You cannot compete. The typical average white person in America has 3,500 times more money than you have. And that's not true only of blacks in America. It's true of the world internationally. What's happening right now is blacks is a marginalized, subordinated class of people all over the earth. You have one half of one percent of wealth in this nation. The same thing is true all over the world. In the world, there's approximately 392 trillion dollars worth of wealth on the earth. And black folk on, around in the world have less than one percent ownership of it. That includes all the African countries. That includes Brazil, Caribbean, and America. You don't own enough control of anything. Whites control almost 100% of all the wealth, power, resources, privileges, and controls of all levels of government. You're playing a game you can't win. You gotta get reparations. Now, how are you gonna get it? Let me give you a run through of three or four things very quickly because I don't wanna take up the time here. First thing you must do, I've heard it mentioned already, we gotta, com gotta commit a national campaign all over this country to start a publicizing the issue of reparations for black folk. Not as something nice, but as a necessity, period. That means every living soul, every organization, every core, every institution in this country must begin to start, start to prop, uh, promoting reparations for black folk all over this country. That's level one. It's a massive, massive promotion of reparations for black folk. Second level, level two. What we must do at second level two now is to start having facts-finding hearings. You must have facts-finding hearings all over this country. And you're going to have facts-finding hearings on, on at least two different levels. 
One is you're going to go after facts finding about what roles governments have played in the reparations, I mean, in the, uh, in the slavery trade against black folk and the enslavement of black folk, the marginalization of black folk. And that should break down into two levels. One is to investigate all levels of domestic governments, that's city, county, federal, and state governments. And the second group would go after the international. So you should have two groups of black folk in this country exploring and fact finding on what, gov what roles government have played, one domestically and one internationally. On the left-hand side, you should be doing the same thing for the, for the domestic side. You should be going after the private sector. You should be going after all the private corporations in the United States, what roles they played and how they benefited directly from slavery. And also, on the same side, you must go after all the international corporations and the roles they played and how they benefited. Now, the Harvest Institute right now, my think tank, we've already picked up one. We put out a press release on that. We are going after domestic domestic role that major corporations played in the United States. We've already identified approximately 240 companies that are still in existence that profiteer directly and enrich themselves off of black folk. We're going after that. And what we have to do in our fact finding is be able to factuate, document, there are direct line between how blacks have been, in, have been crippled all the way up to economically, politically, socially, and educationally, and tied into these major corporations or tied into levels of government. That's your level two. Level three, you must then start having a national convention in this country. And right now, I think um, Alice, uh, Dorothy Tillman in Chicago has already, we talked about this. She's going to try to call one in Chicago this coming year. We must have everybody who's playing a role, like Congressman Conyers and everybody from the Congress and COBRA, everybody should be at a national convention where we all come in there to not only energize each other, but to share information, see where we are. They're trying to set it up for this coming February, someplace in the United States, possibly Chicago. That's your third level. The fourth level you should start doing is trying to get into, trying to, uh, uh, out of this conference should come strategies and plans and a specific role model. You got to have a role mo a model, rather, not a role, a model that every black can tie into. A model for reparations. Now, my model's a little different from everyone else's, and that's because I'm outside the box. I'm going to try to pull everybody else outside if I can get them. Now, most, every, most people are going to try to follow the Jewish uh, reparations model or the Japanese model. I'm following the Indian model. The Indians are the most appropriate model if you want to track down doing anything to get reparations of black folk. Why? Because, you see, only American Indians and black folk were spelled out in the Constitution. The Indians own reservations and black folk. There's a direct lineage between those two groups. And if you really want to track and get reparations, the easiest and quickest way is to go find out what happened to American Indians, what benefits they got, and track it. In my new book called Power Numbers, it takes you every, through every one of those steps you can follow. If you pick that up, you can come right to reparations very quickly because it would be very difficult for the government to deny black folk for the same thing they're giving the Indians. So when you hear, hear people talking about how bad off Indians are, first thing you should say, fine, if Indians are that bad off, put us as black folk in the same status with the Indians. We'll take that. Because see, right, what Indians got, see, in, first of all, nobody declared Indians to be a nation. Indians declared themselves to be a nation. They declared themselves to be a nation all the way up until about 1832 when, when Supreme Court Justice Marshall said, okay, I'll recognize you as a nation. We never declared ourselves to be a nation. We've always tried to do just the opposite of what the Indians did. Once they became a nation, they drew up a constitution for themselves. We never had a constitution. And what the Indians did with that constitution is then to go to the United States government and say, we want to have, we do not want to integrate. We did just the opposite. We integrated. And I can track everything right down or we can follow the Indian model if you want to. And you can see, and you, all that's already built into the law, and there's a direct lineage between American Indians and, and black folk that you can follow very easily and get to reparations. And it's, but, but, let's, but we need to have a model. And in my new book, I get that model. As you'll be on the, you'll understand in about another month, you'll get the, uh, the power numbers model that'll take you through all those steps of what they did throughout history from the Blair Amendments and everything else. You can track them very easily, and it'd be very difficult for the United States government to deny you reparations when you only two people that have a constitutional relationship with this government is black folk and Indians. Just like Indians use natural, what they call natural rights and lay a claim against the land, we should use natural law and lay a claim against our labor, misappropriated labor. The next level what you must do is begin to, uh, is move to a legal step. You need to form at the, at the fourth level, get you a legal body right now, whether it's gonna be pro bono or paid. And out of our convention, we should be able to raise some funds to set up a mass legal body that'll be ready to start serving suits based on those facts that you're gonna find at the second level. And we start to find those, then we should have people going after suits. Going, some, one side suing the different levels of government, other side suing the private sector to get, to get reparation funds for black folk. Then at the last level, you need to set up, at, at, at the sixth level, you need to set up some kind of a pool, or resource, or retrieval agency that want, every time we get some benefits, we're going to a special fund that will be held for pooling and aggregating. Now then out of that, out of that special agency, we break away into two groups, what I would recommend. One, you would have an economic development bank on the East Coast and economic development bank on the West Coast.
And what those banks would do is take most of the money you get and not give it to black folk as individuals. You put it into a massive bank where black folk can go draw that money to start low interest, get low interest loans or free money to build businesses and industries throughout the United States. You also, if you track the Indians, you should go for or try to get yourself some tax-free, tax-exempt land. Just like Indians can go grab any piece of land and federalize and put up a casino, you tell me you ought to do the same thing as a black person, get tax-exempt statuses. We can go on and on. Well, there's a lot of things we can track. Go after the Indians. But the thing that's most important, I'm going to quit, is that you've got to understand that reparations are an absolute necessity. We're going to get buried alive. We do not have enough to be able to compete in this society. And the further we get away from, from, from the civil rights movement, the worse things are going to get. And when people start talking about slavery, don't just talk about slavery. Talk about Jim Crow slavery and benign neglect. You've got to understand what slavery was. Slavery is the illegitimate child of racism. Racism still exists. That's slavery. Because what racism does, racism keeps and maintains what was created by slavery. Now, racism is a, is a competitive economic struggle between groups of people for power and wealth. And it's slavery, I mean, and, and, and racism never existed until the 16th century. And when slavery went out of existence, racism took over. Racism has gone from being meaning slavery to being something biological. Then it moved on in by the 1800s. It turns to be something as a personal behavior or an attitude and now bias and a prejudice. Slave, I mean, racism has nothing to do with uh, attitudes, with prejudice, and with bias. Slave, uh, racism is a competitive group contest between people for race, resources, and for superiority. And racism is a never is a race without a finish line. I thank you very much. Do we have a panel here or what?